Well, thank you, because we're in the last slot of the last day, and there's ice cream. I'm eating ice cream out there. So uh, I, I will try to inform you on some cool things that hopefully we can do something with later. Um, all right, today we're talking about secure performance, scalable and green, the big wins on the static Drupal site. <laughs> All right, my name is Kristen. Uh, I am a co-founder at Quant CDN, and here's some information to get a hold of me if you want. If you're on Drupal Slack, feel free to ping me, uh, DM, whatever. I'm in all the channels and lots of stuff going on there. Uh, a little bit about Quant. Uh, Try not to make this a sales pitch, but just we have some of the services that we will be talking about here along with competitors that we'll throw out as well. But uh, we focus on um, CDN, WAF, Web Application Firewall, static hosting, static failover, a bunch of stuff. So, feel free to check this out. Uh, did make a standalone page. If people want to get a little bit more information, I'll also have this at the end if we don't catch it now. Uh, bit.ly quant devcon 2024 and um, we will happily let you try out the system, all the tools for free. Um, it says for 30 days, so we you know, go beyond that. So if you're just feeling like picking tires and having fun and testing tools, then I'm um, happy to hold your hand through that process. All right, uh, so I'm gonna turn the tables a little bit and see who is in the house. So who here would consider themselves a developer? Okay, most of the room. All right, how about more on the front side, being that kind of thing? All right, uh, about half of those people. How about like project management, content management, marketing? All right, awesome. So we have some there as well. And then, are, is there anyone here that kind of does it all? All the hats, many, many hats? I hear some laughter. Okay, so I think maybe the Originally or not, so there are some people that have many hats that they wear, and I am one of those people, so uh, I'm happy to talk to you about marketing or coding or contribution for Drupal and Starshot. I've been all about Starshot recently, so feel free, you know, after this, if you want to talk about anything, whether it be static or not static, anything Drupal, tech, um, yeah, happy to, to talk to you. So I guess the other thing is maybe getting a sense of where, what types of um, areas you're working in. So who here is, I, I, I know that someone was on um, university, any other university? Oh, okay, a, a few. And then um, government, I would imagine a lot of people, government. Oh, it's, okay, about half the room, all right. Uh, just your regular enterprise, big corporate stuff. Huh, no, not hardly anybody, okay. And then nonprofits. Any nonprofits? Okay. Uh, small representation there with the nonprofits, please. All right, awesome. I, again, I've worked with all of the things. I've been uh, in Drupal and you know, before Drupal, uh, all of these different areas. I'm so happy to chat afterwards. Some disclaimers. I do work at Quant. We will be talking about some of the things that we have. We're not saying that you have to use them. We will have competitors and other options that you can explore. So, you know, <coughs> hopefully, you know, take this all with a grain of salt and do your due diligence. But, you know, we're around, we're, we're friendly, happy to help if we can. The other thing is I will talk about a number of different products and services. I have not personally used every single thing that I have. I have some local malls and things. I can't promise that I know all the ins and outs of all of these different products and services. So um, bear with me if, if you want to know about you know, X, Y, or, or Z, then you know, I might not know about that one. But um, I will give you some examples of things that I have worked with. All right, so let's talk about why static. You know, some of the pros and cons, why you might use it, what are the use cases, and then what are the different pieces of the, you know, all the different pieces of technologies that you need to think about when you're thinking about a static website. And then how do you put those pieces together, kind of an architecture, super high level for that, but uh, how you can put some of those different pieces together to make your static workflow. And then this is a Drupal, primarily a Drupal event. So 
or others who talk about it using static or Drupal. Anyone here not using Drupal, you know, maybe using WordPress or Joomla or I don't know, just something else? Anyone? So, yeah? Using WordPress and Drupal. WordPress and Drupal? Yeah, on the same project? No. <laughs> All right, um, how about like some, maybe some people, there were some front end folks in here, maybe done some decoupled stuff in React or Vue.js, some other uh, JavaScript frameworks. All right, not, not so much, but uh, a little bit. Um, so we will talk, uh, we're not going to talk about the static front ends, you know, like the JavaScript frameworks and jam stacks for the stuff. But uh, we're going to talk about using Drupal natively uh, to generate a, a static site. And then we should have some time for questions. So, you know, last day, last session, people might be itching to go. But happy to take questions um, off the recording as well. And there'll be a number of resources available in the slides. And I will uh, upload the slides to the, the session after this. Or feel free to take these. All right, so why static? Back up, what is static? Uh, who, anyone here do web development in the 90s? Our, oh, awesome, all right, my people, my people. Yeah, so uh, we're just going back, right? We're time traveling back to the 90s and we're building websites from the basics. So that's basically what you're talking about, right? Static website takes your markup, your CSS, your JavaScript, your images, and maybe even if you had some other files, you guys that kind of thing, right? It's just, you can take those, put them on this hosting, should work, put them on this hosting, should work, no backend, no database, none of that stuff, right? What you see is what you get. So what are some of the use cases for static sites? Um, there, there are a number, I listed a few here. So one is a static uh, anyone here use a Wayback Machine for anything? Yeah, most of the room looks like. Uh, super handy. I have used it myself probably within the last few months going and looking at Drupal.org, get some page, look for some stats or whatever. Um, super nice to go back and just see a snatch, snapshot in time and see what was going on. So that's actually a pretty common use case of the static site, especially if you built a site using the tag, and then after a while, you're like, well, I don't really need to edit anymore. It's sort of like, it's done. You know, whatever it was for, maybe it was for this event, and we're like, okay, we don't need it anymore. So you can just make a static version, it's there, it's available for people, but you can just move on. So that's a pretty popular uh, use case. Another that uh, maybe people aren't as familiar with is disaster recovery. So, uh, so disaster recovery is a whole topic, and talks on that, but being able to fail over to something uh, while you're dealing with a disaster. So in this example, you know, say you have a website and whatever, it's getting DDoS, it's on X hosting, it's getting DDoS, you could fail over to a static version of your website while you're dealing with this other emergency that's happening, and at least people will have something that they can go and interact with and, and see that you know, the release of static houses. So that's also um, a super useful way to use static. Uh, another one that we see a lot actually is, especially in government, is having to have a revision history of all your content edits. Um, this can sometimes be a compliance issue for some agency, government agencies or even universities where any edit that happens has to be recorded so that people can go back later and see that whole trail. So that is actually another great uh, use case for using a static website, because you can just kind of get those snapshots in time. And a very popular approach is doing the static front end, which is what we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, your React, your Vue.js, um, you know, Gatsby is very popular with Drupal, and I am not covering that. There have been lots of great talks on that, um, and it is it's a great way to you know, build things if you're a JavaScript front-end developer and you want to use those tools. Um, definitely has its place, but 
like I said earlier, this is really focused on, I have a Google site, I like it, I don't want to build the front end in using you know, some JavaScript framework, happy with the way it is, what can I do? All right, story time. So um, I'll give you probably two or three examples of, of static kind of going. Um, simple case. So quant, we have a Drupal 10 site. Uh, it's very simple, you know, a handful of pages or whatever. You know, not more than a handful, but you know, like, you know, hundreds rather than thousands or millions of pages. And so, but most of the site is pretty static, right? You know, obviously it has some forms, um, we have search, things like that. But uh, you don't need to uh, really have a database, right? I mean, we like Drupal. We, you know, we've used Drupal forever, so we like it and we use it for content editing. But at the end of the day, the end user doesn't really need to be served a Drupal site because there's really not that much dynamic content on the site, right? So that's a very simple use case of using static. A more complex one actually is a project that we worked on, which was a government agency, and actually did want to use, so they had a design company that we were working with, and they, they did want to build all of their content components using Vue.js. But we didn't, the site itself was actually very static, and they had kind of delivered these Vue.js components. But we didn't really need to have that be delivered to the end user. So uh, we actually, on the um, back end, we glued them together so that we just built, you know, they could build the pages, the content editor could build the pages using these components. And then once they did that, did like paragraphs. So people probably have used paragraphs for build flexible landing pages and things like that. There were a lot of developers here. Uh, so it's that kind of architecture, and then it's sort of mapped to these, you know, like a, a design system with Vue.js components, and then, you know, they built their page, and then that page got, you know, got basically was made static, and then got pushed out to the website. Because again, the, the end user, they weren't seeing anything particularly dynamic. It was more that the content editor wanted to be able to pick and choose components and move them around on the page and, and, and do something a little bit fancier. And the last case I will say was, I think I kind of alluded to earlier, is with disaster recovery. So there was another government agency where um, they had a really big outage, uh, really scrambling. I don't remember exactly what the issue was, but um, they were just, you know, very, very thankful that they had set up static failover because it just instantly kicked over. It was like, oh, the page is not responding, and it just kicked over to the static, so it was just sort of a seamless transition. They didn't have stress about it. It was one less thing they had to stress about in a very stressful you know, situation. And then they could um, just go and focus on the problem and not stress about, oh, well, someone's not going to really, you know, find this content or this page, you know, and um, just kind of move, on, move forward. Anyone here use any kind of static right now? Any kind of static? Oh, OK. Do you, what do you use it for? Um, well, Cloudflare actually offers like a free static failover feature that I use for internet archiving. Okay, sweet. Okay, so the, the answer there was uh, Cloudflare with a static failover and internet archive. That's awesome. Okay. And, 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 okay, yeah, we'll be talking a bit more about it a little bit later. Any other static implementations out there? Okay, so people are pretty, um, not using it too much yet. Maybe we'll change your minds. Um, okay, so we're going to go over some pros and cons of using static. And I guess the big con is it's static, right? Because if your site is super, you know, crazy, it's a game site or, you know, something, you know, a lot of interaction and going back to the database and showing stats and all that stuff, this is not going to work, right? This is not going to be useful. But uh, most sites aren't, right? Most sites, what, what we might call brochureware, right? They got it. Most of the site is, you know, it, this, you could just, a static version is totally fine. You know, maybe you have some forums, you have some search, something like that. Um, and that's fine. You can still uh, have a static, most static site, and then have certain pages that aren't static, and that's fine. We'll talk about that later. And then there's a num number of pros as well, right? Security performance, scaling, you know, and we'll, we'll go into a little more detail here. 
Okay, so why are static sites more secure? The bottom line, there's nothing to hack, right? It's just some files. Like, how do you hack a markup file, right? I mean, there's no, there's no database, no backend, right? Uh, so, you know, if you can go fully static, then you could actually lock down. So maybe you still have a hybrid, you could have a hybrid system in Drupal or, or WordPress or whatever, and you have a static front end that's a representation of, of that particular site. But you can lock down that whole back end for your content editors and your you know, site administrators, and then, you know, it, it's behind basic auth or other, you know, firewall, and keep that super safe, right? And then all of like the dependencies, once you, you know, build your stack, right, you've got all of these security patches you have to do and all that stuff, right? And sometimes that takes time, and it just gives you that extra layer of protection of not having to worry about that. Okay, and similarly, it's faster because you don't have a database, you don't have all these queries, you don't have this stuff bogging you down, right? I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's pretty, a lot of these things are kind of based, based on the same principles, right? You don't have to worry about, um, yeah, just like, I've been on site, oh, so I, I've done all the things, so I've done a lot of backend stuff, views, queries that were just like out of control and you end up having to redo the page in order to get you know, custom because the view is just like super slow and stuff like that. I'm sure others in the house, you know, have probably been in such yeah, I see some, I hear some giggles, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, if we can get away from the database, then let's do it, right? And then, if you do that, then you can use a CDN and not just push your uh, images around the world so that you're getting those faster, but you can push everything around the world. You can push your markup, your job, you know, JavaScript, um, all the stuff, so that it's just there and ready to go. Okay, and then because of those things, you can scale. Right? If you end up on the homepage of the New York Times, which would be pretty cool, uh, it can also be, for those on web, web development, that can actually be a little bit concerning that you're hoping that your website will actually you know, handle that kind of load. But it does help, right? Because uh, especially if you're using a CPN and, and pushing things around so that, uh, yeah, you just, it's like, okay, I'm in Santa Cruz, California normally, my content is coming from San Francisco. Someone around here, maybe their content is coming from DC. And you know, someone in Australia, I work with Australians, so you know, they're, maybe they're just coming from Sydney, right? So it's just pushing that information to the right place so that you're getting the fastest uh, response possible and then you can scale better. Now this might be one that isn't as obvious, but you can be more green can actually try to reduce your carbon footprint, and it goes back to the processing, right? If you're able to do most of the stuff static, those files are just easier, right? They're smaller, they don't take any processing, the servers are easier to deal with, right? You can just kind of put it wherever you want, and um, whereas if you're working with like, I don't know, people have worked with huge Drupal websites with massive databases and web servers and just crazy infrastructure and maybe failover on that and all this stuff, right? I mean, you can go pretty, especially with bigger sites, um, enterprise or big government sites, right? You can go and get a lot of compute power, right? Um, but, you know, that obviously isn't great for the planet. So if you can decide, I'm gonna, do as much static as possible, and yeah, okay, maybe it's maybe it's not fully static, but just use that power for the things that you need it for. Now this one is, kind of got called on this one before when I talked about this, but uh, so this one is a little bit controversial. Um, it can cost less to have a static site. But there's a lot of caveats here because it really depends on your website. You can have, uh, it, how much traffic do you have? How much of that can be static? You know, how many users do you need on your, you know, are you, do you have a backend that people are logging into and you do need a dynamic backend? And then how many are using that and how much bandwidth and all these things. And with all the hosting companies, right, there's different tiers for things. You might be able to get away with, you know, a low tier or high, you got a lot of bandwidth, you got a lot of hits. 
So you can't say, oh, you're going to save 50% or you're going to save you know, 80% or 10% or whatever, because it, it's really you have to do the calculation yourself of saying, OK, I'm going to use this for static hosting, this for Drupal hosting, or WordPress, or whatever, and I'm on this tier or that tier, and OK, I'm going to be able to shift you know, this amount over, so I'm going, to, I'm going to reduce my traffic on my Drupal side this much, and then, oh, well, I'm going to get to go from high tier down to the low tier. All right, I saved a chunk of money, right? So, so this one, um, you know, a little, little trick there to quantify, but um, if you do it right, you should save some money. All right, so when is static a good choice? If you have people around the world that are, you know, looking at your stuff, then, you know, you're going to be, use a, you can use a CDN and push stuff around the world, which is great. And again, going back to that dynamic functionality, and it's not an all or nothing. You can still have dynamic. I mean, if you only had a handful of pages that weren't dynamic, then it's probably overkill. It wouldn't necessarily bother. But uh, if you know a good chunk of your site can be static, then it could be a really good choice. If you're security focused, right? So, so most secure things having static, right? That that certainly makes it much easier to tick those boxes. And we talked about uh, trying to be a little bit nicer to the planet as well. All right, so with that, let's talk a little bit about different technologies that, and tools that you can use when you're doing static sites. So there's kind of a different pieces to the puzzle, right? You, you need a content source, and we're at a Drupal event, right? So Drupal's a natural you know, choice there that we talked about maybe using WordPress. It's another thing you might, some people do markdown files. Uh, you know, maybe you have a personal blog and you just want to write markdown and then push it to GitHub pages. No, there's steps like done, right? So there's a lot of different ways, you know, you might be reading directly from the database using the API, that kind of thing. And then with the content source, you need to be able to get that content into hosting, right, somehow. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. One is using some sort of scraper or crawler, which is going to look at the website and say, okay, I'm gonna grab all that information and I'm gonna stick it in hosting. So that's one approach. The other approach is using a static site generator. And people might be familiar with that term because you often hear about that with like Tome, which we talked to, you know, about briefly earlier, or, or the Jamstack, we talked about you know, static site generators and things like Axie and all that. So those are two different approaches. One is you know, you're grabbing the content, the site content from the outside, and the other one, you're in the site and you're pushing it um, and generating that content. And then, of course, you need to host the static content somewhere. So yeah, you could do markdown. You, know, you have a source of content. You can do markdown. You can do CSV. Basically, however you want to structure your content, whatever your website uh, needs are. Uh, I've done a lot of projects, like that one I talked about earlier with UJS. We use JSON API and grab content um, from Drupal that way. But yeah, there's any number of ways that you can store your content. Of course, we're at Drupal, and a lot of people uh, are going to use Drupal as their content store. OK, for scrapers slash crawlers, there's kind of two different approaches here. You can use command line tools. So I'm sure there were quite a few developers, people who use command line, wget, or some crawler or something. I see some head nods, yeah. Uh, another approach is to use some uh, software as a service, so SaaS sort of crawler. And um, when I did some research on this a few months ago, uh, so Quant has a crawler, but I, I did struggle to find too many that uh, did a similar thing. I did find a Zite Scrapey Cloud. Um, I didn't try it out, but uh, it, it was something that seemed like you would be able to you know, do Scrapey in order to scrape a, a website, and you might be able to do something similar. So, and oh, I guess with all of these things, if, if you know of a tool that you use or you've heard about, happy to update the slides with other information. Um, so just take me after. Okay, and then on the static site generator side, like we mentioned, you know, you probably have heard of, if you, even if you haven't worked with it, you probably heard of Gatsby or some of the, you know, Next, Next, or all these fun front end systems that, you know, people like to use. 
Um, again, this talk is not about those, but you know, it is, those are considered static site generators as well. And then there's simple ones like Jekyll, where could you mark down and, um, and convert that over to a static site. So most of these um, are sort of uh, not necessarily just Drupal. Uh, the last two I have Quant and Tom, so we will be talking about Tom, which we talked about earlier. Uh, those are more Drupal specific solutions, whereas the others are a little bit more generic. The ones with the blue all have some sort of Drupal integration, and so if you wanted to go on the more of the you know uh, JavaScript front end you know framework. Approach there are some, which would be next, Gatsby and next. And then if you wanted more of the, eh, I'm good with my theme, I'm good with my pages, I don't want to do any of that JavaScript stuff, then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Quantum Tome and actually a couple others. Okay, who here is used built with to look at stats or whatever? Yeah. I have to look people. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun, like if there's some insert new technology, you know, new JavaScript framework, you know, it seems like every day there's a new framework, right? So you can go in and, and see what it thinks that, you know, the sites, how many sites are actually using that particular technology. So it's actually kind of handy. And I guess let me back up just one sec. So here, um, had some numbers from GitHub pages. So, you know, like next 97,000. Uh, Gatsby, 54,000, that kind of thing. Um, and then the stats from the was were you know, fairly aligned with the sort of the popularity of these different systems. Uh, so you know, it could give you, especially if you're learning new things or want to adopt, you know, want to adopt something that's maybe not too cutting edge, but you know, still you know, people are using that you can kind of see uh, you know, where, the, where the, the, the bleeding edge versus the kind of tried and true are. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about static hosting. And I don't even have enough space to put all the different kinds of hosting options out there, right? Because you can roll your own. Anyone here use Lino, DigitalOcean, those kind of things? Yeah, a few people. Um, or maybe we talked about the Cloudflare pages, uh, GitHub pages, that kind of, kind of a little bit more, you know, very simple, you know, push the static content over in, in this very simple manner. This is some, have they used that? Who is used S3? Who has not used S3? I guess maybe it's a question. But, you know, S3 is certainly super popular. Um, and whether we like it or not, we've probably used it. And then the kind of the bottom, other than digital ocean and line are more of a little bit more full featured. So if you need more, you need the CDN, you need the WAF and maybe failover and things. Um, you start getting the stuff that you know you have a lot of options. Maybe you need search built in or, or supporting forms or things like that. And so you know there's there's many many to choose from. A little bit overwhelming, but um, the ones shown in blue, again, those are ones that have some sort of Drupal module on Drupal.org. So if you want to, you know, if you are thinking Drupal, you may want to narrow, narrow down things to, you know, the ones that, um, you know, integrate well with Drupal. And now we'll talk a little bit of like putting those pieces together. Again, this is super high level. Um, so I use architecture very lightly uh, for this. Um, okay, and, I, and I've touched upon this already. You can have a fully static site, right? That you don't have any dynamic pages. That doesn't mean you don't have forms or you don't have site search because you can still integrate with third party at Algolia or you know there's these third party forms or things like that. Or you know you could still have your Google Analytics or whatever. Um, marketing tools and you know all that kind of JavaScript stuff that you would expect to have on a website. It's not like you're done down your website. You can still have a lot of the things that you would expect to have, but you can still have it you know fully static. And then there's the partially static, and that's actually maybe more common, um, at least in the sites that we work with, just because uh, you know, they're bigger, you know, tend to be bigger sites, and so there's a lot going on, and they're going to have some things that just can't be static. And with that, what you do is you have something called a proxy, where you basically just says, oh, 
for this URL or the set of URLs, just go back to the Drupal site or whatever your you know your main website is being it is you know whether WordPress or Drupal or whatever, and you can just wrap those back. And but all the rest of the stuff is going to the static version of the site. So some pros and, and also I guess again you can use that kind of crawl, you know, crawl the site aspect, or you can do the static site generation approach as well. So we'll talk a little bit about pros and cons for those. For using a crawler, I mean it's pretty simple, right? You just point it at a website and you say, crawl it for me, and boom, okay, now you have a static version. Uh, you typically don't need any kind of backend access, assuming the site is you know publicly available, but you're gonna have to recrawl when there's changes, right? So this could work fine if your site is updated you know, once a week once a month, whatever, it's you know, lightly used and you don't have a lot of changes coming through. Maybe you just say, okay, I'm gonna put it on the schedule, I'm gonna call it once a week. Maybe the content doesn't have to be super timely with the updates. But, so that can be a, a good approach. Uh, most of the options that I saw were really the command line ones, which isn't necessarily great if you want to have a little bit more of a non-technical person be able to control that stuff. Uh, or at least on a, you know, someone that's very command line uh, oriented. And also, a lot of these approaches you can see that directly integrate with any kind of static hosting that I could find. Um, uh, and Quant does, but yeah, I was, I was struggling to find something that just made it easy to call, and then boom, it was in kind of some static hosting uh, um, environment. But again, feel free, if you happen to know of anything, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Or um, you know we can talk about it at the end. And then with static site generators, obviously you know there's a little bit more to set up. It's not just like point it at a, the website and then crawl it and all good. Uh, you typically do have to have access to the back end in order to set all these things up and, and make that work. But one advantage is rather than having to recrawl everything is usually you can do something called an incremental where you know maybe your site has 10,000 pages and it's a little much to get all of that initial content, content over, but at that point you're good because any new content you can just hit push over the incremental, right? So maybe people are you know creating a new page you know once a day or you know 10 times a day or whatever, or they're making some updates, but that kind of incremental they can do. Um, so it's just a, it's a much lighter process at that point. Uh, there are a lot of Drupal integrations with static site generators, so it gives you some options there, uh, depending on your your use case. And there are ways of pushing that directly into some sort of hosting environment. So it just kind of streamlines things a little bit. So now let's just talk about Drupal specifically. We're at Drupal Camp, and we've got a Drupal guy. He's all secure with his sunglasses, protecting himself from UV rays, and he's got his uh, tanks on, so he's gonna run fast. And he's looking really good. <laughs> all right. So, okay. I mentioned before, like, I've done projects where we've worked with, like, JSON API and things like that. I mean, you can get super complicated with these static things, but I'm, I'm not gonna go into that. I've talked about that at other places. And um, if you want to do that kind of stuff, Feel free to ping me, I can find some resources for you, um, and maybe some at the end as well. And then there's you know these lever, these you know, Gatsby and Next and uh, all these more specialized integrations, which you know could those could be talks on their own, they have been, so I'm not gonna talk about that. There's really really those two focus areas, right? Um, you can strike your site and upload it into some sort of hosting environment, or you can use Drupal in order to generate that static content and get it into hosting. So those are the, the two approaches. This slide is super familiar because we've seen it already. Um, nothing new there, but basically that, that is the one approach. And if you're doing command line stuff, you know, hopefully you're using IDE. I just opened up Mac terminal, I'm like whatever. So uh, it'll look prettier than this if you're at, you know doing real development, but you know, you get the idea. Like, say, hey, grab this site, and then it just starts damaging. 
Now, if you use a software as a service, again, I struggle to find other ones, um, except for that site one, then hopefully it's a little easier, right? You can just like point it and say, here's the URL that you want to, to crawl. You can set up it on a schedule and say, okay, I want to do it once a week, once a day, that kind of thing. Again, if you have a huge site, you got to factor that in. Um, and you can actually, uh, another approach is a little bit more on the dev side, but you can set these up. There's an API, right? So if you did want to be a little more clever and only send over certain things, certain um, at a time, certain URLs or whatever, you can actually integrate this um, with DevOps tools and things like that. But, you know, having just a simple UI works for, you know, a lot of sites. So when you're thinking about how you're syncing the content over, if you're doing that crawling, uh, like a local crawling, right, either you use, you know, insert, you know, simple crawler or whatever you're using, you crawl it, and then you have to upload it into the hosting, and then change the time to do it again, right? So it's, it's a bit labor intensive. The status crawler, you know, a little bit easier because, you know, you're using the UI or you know, use the API, but crawl it, something happens, again, you do have to either have it on schedule or you're going to have to tell it to recall. Um, so, you know, not the best if you want, like, things that are just up, up to date, up to the minute things, changes, but, um, you know, it, it does fit in use case. Now, if you want to do more of the static site generation with Drupal, uh, there's some options. So, Quantum, you have a Drupal module where you can do that. There's Tome that we talked about a little bit earlier. So Tome is sort of a, it's sort of a core, not core module, but it's a, it's a contributed module that um, sets up sort of a way to just generate your Drupal site into static files. Then there's all these other modules that are kind of tied into it. They're not by the same person usually. Some of them are, but uh, they're kind of their own independent ones. So you're basically like, oh, I want to use Tome and GitHub pages, which I think might have been an example that was said earlier. Or, oh, I want to use, you know, AWS um, and Tome, you know, like S3 or something. And you use them together, right? So if you just use Tome by itself, you'll, you'll end up with the files where you still have to do something with it. So then I recommend that you use one of the existing other modules where you can actually get it over to hosting at that point. There are a couple other projects that I'm less familiar with. They are uh, on Drupal.org, which are static site generator and static suite. So um, yeah, so these are the only tools that are available. If you want to play around with that, um, there are some other options as well. OK, so I'll just give you a quick example of what the kind of workflow would be. Create an account, um, so this example is for Quant, and I'll give you one with, with uh, Tone and Netlify. Create an account, uh, there's an API, right? So a lot of these systems, right, you get some sort of API key, got to enter that in, into the Drupal UI, so connect those, the, your Drupal site to your Quant account. And then uh, in Quant, there's the idea of seeding, which is basically means you're taking all your content and pushing it over. Um, so that big, you know, batch, is, is a big one. Uh, this is something that does work that if you have a tiny site, you could, you could just do it through the UI, but uh, most sites aren't tiny, so you're going to need to use uh, Drush in order to push that over, and it's going to do them in batches, um, in you know, parallel and then in batches in order to get through the whole site. Um, so once that's over there, you can look at it and you can say, oh, yeah, that looks good, that's my site, and then you can make it live, configure your your you know, production domain and, and hook it up. So fairly straightforward. Um, I did, when I played around with Tom and Netlify, I did find it a little bit more cumbersome. And uh, a few more steps, I mean, it's doable, uh, but a few more steps that you have to do. One was uh, I set up kind of a dummy site so that when I saved my content over, it would just overwrite that dummy and say so index.html hello world, right? And then I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna obliterate that and sync all my content over there. Um, so you know, that was a little bit, it was fine, not a big deal. 
Um, what I found a little bit more challenging is that they have this idea of um, deploys, and you know, so you have different sort of versions, and then you look at that, and then you say, okay, I want to publish that, I want to publish that, which you know may be useful for, for some people if they want to basically have like um, a staging environment before they do it. Normally we do that a little differently on quantum projects where someone has a Drupal staging site and they have you know, a production site and they're both saved to the wrong stack version. So if you want to play around, you can go and see what it looks like. And so the, the workflow is a little bit different. Um, but anytime you had to, uh, you know, you push over new changes into Netlify, then you had to, you know, publish that deploy, as they call it. So for that, um, so like I said, for Quant, you, know, you do generate static, uh, you know, with the seed, and then if there's a change, so the way it is out of the box, if there's a change that happens, someone edits a page, creates a new page, it just automatically goes over. It's already just by default, you can't turn that feature off, but by default that is turned on, so you don't think about it. Right? So your content editor just makes you page, get synced, you're all good. Uh, with the tone that uh, the way that I tested it, I didn't see any magic buttons to make this more streamlined, so happy to be corrected, but it was a little bit more labor intensive, like I mentioned, because you had to, you know, you make those changes and then you have to basically push a thing that says, okay, get them over there, get them over there, and then um, publish the, the preview. So, a few more steps. And something, uh, so I talked about this at DrupalCon Portland, and Starshot was all the buzz there. Um, how many here have heard of Starshot? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Um, so I was just trying to think, like, would it be useful, you know, would it make sense or would it be useful for Drupal people to have some easy way just to be like, press a button? And then it just magically, there's eh, it's a static site, you know, with not too much setup or any of this stuff to like even streamline it even more. Would that help with Drupal adoption? I don't know. I'm open to thoughts and opinions on that to see what people think. Because um, oh, another hat that I wear is I'm actually on the Starshot um, advisory council as well. So if you have ideas about Starshot, I'm happy to hear about that. And then, I had this earlier, but if you didn't catch it and you want to look again, the, there is just a page that tells a little bit more about, um, you know, Drupal and, and this, this specific font, but you can get a hold of us. Um, also happy to connect on LinkedIn, as I said. So with that, let's see. Oh, all right, technically maybe out of time, but I will see if we have some questions. Yeah. A couple slides back, you had some of the Drupal modules that yep. were you know, for generating stuff. Are any of those um, uh, the results of Pittsburgh with the, what was it? Uh, oh, yeah, the Pittsburgh library, thing. Was it going like the, the JS framework -y Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so Drupal, um, what was last year, right? They, they did. Yeah, Pittsburgh, they did Pittsburgh, which was like, they funded, they got money from a bunch of organizations. That was actually a really cool like, innovation project, right? And like, okay, let's get some money from Drupal agencies and other people and, and, and find, you know, use those money and find some cool ideas. Um, one of them was more, it wasn't any of this, but um, yeah, they, they did do some things that were maybe tangent to this. I think, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was kind of like the whole idea of there, there's all these different ways that we're trying to make these you know JavaScript based kind of front ends work with Drupal. And there's nine different ways, and it's like let's yeah. let's get one that is kind of bulletproof, and then you know we can maybe scale it from there or whatever. I didn't know if like the static site there is what I was thinking. Maybe that's yeah. I yeah, that's a good question. I think the static site has actually been around for a while. This is static site though, it's more. Um, so yeah, just for the recording, yeah, there was um, one that was more focused on maybe trying to more on the jam stack side of things and trying to maybe make a little more sense out of that for Drupal folks. Um, uh, yeah, I'll have to follow up on that because I'm not sure. I know that they demoed some of the, the results of Fitchburg from at Portland, but I don't. 
don't sure remember that part, um, so I'll have to get back to you on that. So we'll talk later. Yeah. Um, you mentioned partially static sites, and it got me thinking about the security benefit that you had mentioned in prior slides. Yeah. So that obviously the, the security benefit of a static site is that there is no, at least no publicly available CMS for to serve as an attack surface, right? Yeah. In a partially static site, I presume, like the way the quant does it, the, the CMS is online, it is available, but it is but it's blocked off by yeah, so being blocked in. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so the question is, well, okay, I understand security for a fully static site, that seems more obvious to block down by it. But what about this partially static thing where there's still potentially an attack vector, right? Maybe it's still, you know, it still needs to be accessible to the outside world. So with that, what we do is we have a web application firewall. Um, yeah, so, um, which, I mean, if you have a Drupal website with no static, you should have a, some sort of an application firewall in order to protect you. Um, and then that will try to keep out the bad actors and the DDoS and all that kind of fun stuff that people do. Um, yeah, so it kind of reduces your footprint just because you have less accessible, you know, on the internet, some less pages that the, they can be trying to hack. Um, doesn't mean that it's not hackable, but um, it does just, you know, make it a little bit, uh, you know, e easier to protect. You just have less things that you have to focus on, like, okay, we're going to really focus on security for these particular pages rather than, like, you know, the entire site. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, sure. So would you like, could you host the CMS part that the part that content editors would have access? Could you like host it with a different URL or something like that? And then it like when you deploy, it goes to your property URL? Or is that I don't know? Yeah, so yeah, so actually that's how it works. It's actually added So um, yeah, I guess I, I didn't actually make that part clear, but what happens is when the new Drupal hosting, which is that you know what edit, I mean, you can make it more obscure, but, you know, edit.mysite.com, right, and that's where your Drupal stuff is happening, and then, but your site is really, you know, mysite.com, or www.mysite.com, yeah, so they are um, separated, because it's actually uh, different kinds of hosting, um, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, you said uh, that it makes caching more simple. Uh, but if you're updating it, like obviously with the service like Quant, you could clear cache when it falls through. But if you're just pushing it to a static site location, how does this make caching more simple? Ah, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a yeah, that's a fair challenge. Uh, so, so I, I've been called a little bit on the caching. Maybe, maybe it's an ad, Maybe it's not as simple. I guess <coughs> when it's made more simple is when. Um, it's fully static, so at least on the, the Drupal side of things, you're not necessarily having to, you know, configure all the bells and whistles of caching and make you know, the caching onion. Uh, it makes you cry, all of those things, right? You can, uh, you know, maybe simplify that a bit. But, um, yeah, no, that's fair. So, caching is fun, interesting. It could be its own talk of all the layers, and I've thought about doing it before, but it just kind of made me yeah, not super happy to talk about. So, um, yeah, so it is a challenge because one of the things that people are like, why am I not seeing my thing? I just published the thing, why am I not seeing the thing? So there are ways of, it is a little more configuration, but you can set up different kinds of purging based on like cache tags and things like that. So there are some add-ons, I would still be kind of simple, in a way, but there are some add-on modules. Um, so there's Quant Perger, where um, there's, you can set up stuff on Cron, and it's checking tags and seeing what you know what related content is also needed. Great, because you change your page, but maybe something else is referring to that, like in a teaser from a view or whatever, right? Um, so yeah, uh, they don't want to get into too much technical detail, but yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. Caching can be a pain, and um, your mileage may vary a little bit on that one. Thanks for keeping me honest. All right, welcome back. Is the static site ideal for small sites or 
Um, I mean, you can use it for a small side if you want. Um, oh, I mean, I would actually disagree. I mean, as long as this, the large site um, has isn't like dynamic pages, um, you can get a really big benefit from using it for a large site. Now, that initial push of all of that content over that. If you have 100,000 pages on the site and you need to get that over, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to chunk through that, right, and get all that stuff. It might take a few days to really get all that stuff synced over. But at that point, then you kind of reap the benefit of, you know, having, you know, things faster. And um, so, although the upfront might be a little bit of a pain, it certainly, you get all the benefits. Any other questions? 